We've made our way today to chapter 3. I want to ask you to do something. If you have a bulletin, I want you to take your bulletin. I want you to take your pen. And I want you to scratch through a word in the title and replace it with a different word. I want you to scratch through the word Christianity and replace it with the word thinking. I'll explain to you why that is. Man-centered versus God-centered thinking. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 9. I'm going to read this. I would like for you to follow along in your Bible or on the screen. And stand with me if you would. Out of honor for the Word of God. First Corinthians 3, 1 to 9. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk. Not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants, he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and as we read it today, may the Lord help us to see what is there and to toss what is not there, but in today's parlance, particularly a couple of decades ago, a new category of Christian was suggested, and that's not what the Scripture teaches. Thank you. Please be seated. Well... Years ago, a leader of a popular ministry, a ministry that I greatly admire, came out with a pamphlet about being a spirit-filled believer. He suggested that in life's journey, there are three types of people, and he put them forward in circles. One circle showed a life in disarray, a chair which suggested a throne, ego, the letter E on the throne, and a cross representing Christ outside the circle. He said that's the natural man. That's, we read about him last week in chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. He suggested that there was another circle. It was, again, this time life in Uh, in symmetry, a chair representing the throne, the cross on the throne, representing Jesus on the throne, and E for ego at the foot of the throne, and said, this is the spiritual man. And all that could be applauded. You could take those two circles, put them on the two paths, the narrow path, the wide path, know exactly where they go. You could put them through the two gates, the narrow gate, the wide gate, know exactly which one goes through which. Put them in the two houses, the house built on the rock, the house built on the sand, know exactly where each one goes. The problem was the third circle. He described it as a a circle that where life is again in disarray, where ego is on the throne, and the cross this time, Jesus Christ is not outside the circle, but in the circle, and said, this is the carnal Christian. Now, you may have been taught that along the journey. It was well intended, but it was very unfortunate because it developed a category that people could say, well, I'm just a carnal Christian. I'm going to be in heaven just like you. But, and he described the carnal Christian as someone who had no desire for Bible study, no desire for, for being with the people of God, no desire to share. The, all, these, all these absence of desires that the Scripture says in the New Covenant, God places the desire in you. So I want you to know as we're studying this passage, we are not teaching the doctrine 
mistakenly asserted, called the carnal Christian. What we are teaching, what Paul was teaching, was the clash in a church where he calls the Corinthians believers when a man-centered mindset goes against a God-centered mindset. I want you to keep that in mind, and we'll see. And therefore, when I, when I entitled this, and was looking at it later in the week, I thought, Askel, you have unwittingly described what you're going to tell the people is not true. <laughs> man-centered Christianity is a contradiction of terms. Christians may, for a season, find themselves in a, in a backward condition acting in a man-centered way, but that is not a category, an acceptable category of Christianity in terms of pattern and behavior. Paul is now honing in. I told you that even though he mentioned, we read the passage in chapter 1, verses 10 to 17, that we began this study with, where he's talking about the division in Corinth. He's very concerned about the division. And so you see that context when we come to read the passage today. He's very concerned about division. The strife and the jealousy that he talks about. And he wants to deal with it. And he'll continue to deal with it. He's come back to it having set the tone of how, how foolish the so-called wisdom of the world is. Cultivating a mindset of worldliness. How dangerous fleshiness is. He mentions that in this passage. So let's look at this, this, this sin of division is always closely related to other sins. You see, it's very seldom that you or I sin in a singular category. Theft, the Eighth Commandment, is usually prompted by the Tenth Commandment, covetousness. The same is true for adultery, covetousness. In fact, I would suggest to you that every category of sin is driven by covetousness, a, 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 an inordinate desire for that that someone else has that you do not have or do not have in the abundance that they have, and your idea that you deserve it. Covetousness is also a discontentment with the providence of God in your life. And so they're always interrelated. One sin leads to another. We saw in David's case last uh, couple of Sunday nights, last Sunday night I believe it was, that his lust for Bathsheba gave way to his adultery with Bathsheba, gave way to his setting up her husband to be murdered in battle, and then, not addressing it, gave way to his breaking the ninth commandment. He didn't come clean with the truth until he was confronted by the prophet. Sins always lead to other sins. In chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 2, verse 16, Paul has been pointing out that the Corinthians were divided because of worldliness. That's why he spent some time on the idea of, of worldly wisdom. That their thinking was a worldly wisdom. And in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, there's a, there's a character, Mr. Worldly Wise Man. And worldly wise man misleads the pilgrim as to how he can get rid of the burden of sin that's on his back. Tells him there's a fellow named Mr. Legality in the town of morality. And all he need do is climb to the top of the mountain. And Mr. Legality will tell you how to get that burden off your back. If you remember the story, Bunyan took that approach, began to climb, but the more he climbed, climbed the incline of the mountain shifted drastically. In fact, the more he climbed, the more he found himself doing something like this. Uh, like some, uh, some of these people that, that climb up uh, I've lost the term. What's the term where they go up the little, what is it, Josh? Hmm? 
Rock climbing, thank you. Mountain, rock, they're in the same category. Rock climbing, thank you. Mountain climbing didn't sound right. Rock climbing. And you see some of these fellows, and they just climb. But this got worse and worse for, for uh, Pilgrim until he could not do it anymore, and he came back down. Evangelist confronted him. He said, where have you been? What you do? He said, well, this Mr. Worldly Wise Man told me I could go to the town of morality. In other words, I could, I could get rid of this burden by works, by just doing some things. Well, Paul is chiding the Corinthians because they've embraced, brought into the church the worldly philosophies that they were raised with. You see, so he deals with worldliness. Now, in our passage today, chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, he shows them that they were divided because of the flesh. So, so a worldly mindset and a fleshly attitude, and it continues to yield to evil in their humanness. He shows the cause, the symptoms, and the cure here. See, the church, I don't know if you grew up like this, but the church I grew up in thought of worldliness only in terms of dancing, alcoholic drinking, and things like that. My godly mother, one of the most godly women I've ever known, was convinced that if I ever started smoking, I would start drinking. And if I ever started drinking, I would start dancing and so on and so forth, and it would lead me down a path to no return. So when I suggested I wanted to go to a dance in junior high, she thought, oh my goodness, he's smoking and drinking already. That was, I was raised that way. But see, worldliness is much deeper than that. It's much deeper than bad habits. Worldliness is an orientation. It's a mindset. It's a way of thinking and believing. It's a worldview, if you please. It buys into the world's philosophies, putting human wisdom above all others. I told you at the outset of the study that, that we, have to, we have to learn as believers to, to one fellow said, think Christianly that there is human logic or reason, there is human illogic, and then there is biblical reasoning. And we've got to learn increasingly to reason as Christians, biblically. Because the Bible has some things that look to be illogical by man's Mentality, And that's what Paul's been after here in these verses we studied earlier. The wisdom of man is foolishness to God, Paul has said. And now we take a look. You see, one of the writers that we studied in disciple-making along the way said, and I thought he said so poignantly, he said, make no mistake about it. When anyone comes into the church you're serving, that person has already been discipled. They've been discipled by a consumer mentality that's in the world. And you're going to have to untrain that in order to introduce to them biblical discipling and biblical disciple making. Paul was dealing with the same thing. It's not a new idea. They wouldn't have called it consumers then. But the consumer today comes in and says, what's in it for me? What have you got? Let me see your, what what do you offer here? Well, I can get a better deal down the street. That's the consumer mentality. Worldliness looks to the world, to human leaders, to influential and popular people, neighbors, associates, fellow students, for standards, attitudes, and meaning. It accepts the world's definitions of things, the world's measuring sticks, the world's goals. So if you're paying attention in in what's happening in the culture right now, you know that our vice president came out recently and said that that one one of the hard, fast principles for his marriage has been that he's never alone with another woman, with a woman who's not his wife. Now, there was a day when that would have been applauded. But if you've been paying attention, he's not getting applause. He's a narrow-minded bigot. He doesn't believe in gender equality. How could someone, I feel so sorry for, for him and for his wife. That's turning it on its head completely, folks. So we're, we're surrounded 
by worldly thinking. We have to, like the proverbial salmon, swim upstream against this culture at every turn. So I want us to think for a few minutes. We're just going to introduce this today, and we're going to try to deal with it uh, in its entirety next week along three lines from this passage. Man-centered thinking stunts spiritual development. Secondly, man-centered thinking stirs division. And third, God-centered thinking destroys man-centered thinking. The more we think the things of God, the less we are susceptible to the world's way of thinking. So I want us to look at this for a few minutes today. Look at verses 1 through the first part of verse 3. Man-centered thinking stunts spiritual development. He says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. If there's any question what he's talking about, he's not talking about people who are unconverted. What he's talking about is people who are, who are acting unconverted because they're, in, they're acting in spiritual infancy. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. Within a month's time, toward the end of December into the end of January, we were blessed with two precious new grandchildren, two little girls. They're beautiful. They're fun to watch. It's fun to coax them to get a grin out of them. And you hope that they're grinning at you and not responding to something that's happening gastrointestinally in their lives. But watch them grow. They're going to be selfish. They're going to cry and let you know I'm not happy about something. Well, that's understandable. You said you, you accept that. But if at the age of 20, these baby girls who are now young women still cry, pout, carry on as infants. It's not cute anymore. It's perplexing. It's frustrating. And can get on some level disgusted. Again, I would submit to you that we live in a day when I would think unwittingly, I don't think anybody did this on purpose, a generation is being raised, has been raised, that's being called cupcakes, snowflakes, who need safe spaces in order to feel good about things, who can't stand to hear anything that seems to go against how they feel and what they think. When I was growing up, the only safe space was the place where my dad was not when he was getting ready to spank me. And that safe place was often invaded quickly. Paul is concerned about the spiritual growth or the lack of spiritual growth in the Corinthian church. They hadn't gotten out of their spiritual infancy. You see, if you see someone who's physically impaired, someone who uh, is maybe emotionally or psychologically impaired, that's not of their doing. But someone who's spiritually impaired, that's self-inflicted. Because it's always our own doing. You may not have the best human preacher or teacher, but by grace through faith, when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You have the teacher whose calling and desire is to teach you, to lead you and me into truth. If we don't grow spiritually, if we're not growing spiritually, it's always because of fleshly reasons. It says, even now, you're not ready for solid food because you're in the flesh. Still fleshly. 
infants. What he's talking about here is that in, in an area in that, the life of that church, this, this area of division, this outcropping, if you please, this outcropping of carnality where, where they're choosing sides because one likes a certain preacher better than the, and the other one likes a different preacher. Paul is troubled because of what it says about them and where they are in the journey. I want to tell you, secondly, that man-centered thinking stirs division. He says that this div divisive attitude here is a reflection of what he says in verse 3b. While there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So here's what he, that's why people get confused about this passage. He's called them spiritual infants. Now he says they're behaving in a human way. They're acting in this area of their divisive attitude. They're choosing up sides concerning their, their favorite preacher. They're acting like human beings. It's what my, what my friend R.F. Gates, my mentor R.F. Gates used to say when we would be involved in some sort of controversy. He'd look at me and say, Bill, now did a person, did that person have to get saved to be that way, to be mean, to be unconsiderate, to be divisive? Did they have to get saved to be that way, or could they have been saved, could they have been that way without being saved? In other words, Bill, isn't that reflective of a person that's unconverted? Surely salvation didn't make them that way. I've had people through the years tell me, well, that's just the way I am. And I say, well, do you claim to be saved by grace through faith? Yeah. I said, well, then Paul would say that's what you were. And so Paul is concerned that there's jealousy and strife and that it's manifesting itself in such a way that if you were to watch them conducting themselves in the life of the body at Corinth, you could draw the conclusion they're only, they're just acting like human beings. They're not acting like someone that's met Jesus. For when one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Grace brings a change. No matter what age you are when you're saved, no matter what your life experience when you're saved, there's a change. That's why the word conversion is used. Conversion is the picture of someone who, who came into life walking this way and was converted. He was turned, began to walk another way. Paul's saying to them, you're not acting like you're converted. We're going to come back next week, God willing, and look at the remedy to this. What, what is the remedy to the temptation, the tendency, the, the manifestation, the outcropping of carnality when it manifests itself in division? And we're going to look at the, a little more deeply at this idea of jealousy and strife. Then we're going to look at the remedy that Paul proposes. And it's a wonderful remedy. It's the gospel. It's the outworking of the gospel when when man-centered thinking is destroyed or subdued by God-centered thinking. I don't know where you are today. Well, I know we we'll profess to be saved, but deep down, where are you? Where are you? Is grace giving you the tools to fight against the things that Paul said should not be manifested in a congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ? We have a perfect gospel. It's a good thing because we're an imperfect church. But the perfect gospel always brings the imperfect church through to a gospel-centeredness, a God-centeredness. And that's my prayer for me. It's my prayer for you. And for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior, let me tell you something. You're the circle with ego on the throne and the cross outside. And you ought to with haste Seek the Lord. Say, dear God, help me. Help me to become a Christian. I want Christ on my throne. I don't want, I'm not going to offer Jesus to anybody as a Savior and say, well, you can get him inside your life, and then maybe later on he'll, you'll let him up on the throne. No, that's no Savior. He's offered in the Scripture as Lord and Savior. I want to ask you, is Jesus Christ your Lord today? That's the question. Is he the one who influences your decisions? See the one who captivates your mindset. See the one who corrects your wrong thinking. Is he the Lord? 
If he's not Lord, then it's because there's a man-centered thinking that needs to be submitted to the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read about Corinth, and on the one hand, we're, we're appalled, we're troubled at what was going on there, but on the other hand, we're so grateful that you, by the Spirit, instructed Paul to acknowledge them as a church, as a, as a called-out assembly of believers. So, Father, I pray that you would work in my heart, the hearts of my brothers and sisters here, and help us to, to spot in our lives the residue, the remnant of man-centered thinking, this, this, this remaining sin and put it to death that our thinking would be God-centered, controlled by the Spirit, growing in grace, making more of you, making much of Jesus, making less of ourselves.